Okay, I want to welcome everybody back to our Ephesians study. Uh, we're currently doing a study of Ephesians, and we're, uh, for the last two weeks, uh, three weeks, we have been looking at spiritual warfare, spiritual warfare, and we're going to resume our study of spiritual warfare tonight. So before we get started in preparation for our study, Let's spend a few moments of silent prayer. This will give you the opportunity to examine yourself to make sure you are in fellowship with God. With that being said, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we bow before you uh, this evening. Uh, we thank you for another day of your grace. We ask of you, Lord, because of what Christ have done over 2,000 years ago at the cross, you made him who did not commit a sin to be sin for us so that we may be made the righteousness of God in him. Lord, we stand righteous in Christ. But Lord, in our life, every single day, we're yet to be righteous. We always fail. We all will always mess up because of our old sin nature and our choice to give in to temptation and what we think, what we say, and what we do. But thank you for your grace and forgiving us of sins we commit after salvation. So we ask you to clean us from all sins so that we can be able to fellowship with you. For you are holy, you're righteous, and set apart from sin. Thank you, Father, for the freedom that we do enjoy uh, to gather together to study your word. But, Lord, we know uh, that we're losing a lot of the freedom that we have enjoyed. And we know that uh, one of the reasons we have are losing freedom uh, is because of people's attitude toward your word, uh, mainly believers. And so a lot of blessing we're losing um, because of our own personal uh, contribution through just being negative toward your word as a church, as a whole. And so we ask that you revive the church. We call, pray that believers will have a heart of obedience that they would not be ignorant of what's going on in the world, but that we would turn back to you with all of our hearts, souls, and minds so that we can continue to enjoy the blessing in this country. And Lord, as we see in Leviticus, the five cycles of discipline, one of the uh, discipline is when we lose our freedoms. And when we don't understand the world, we cannot understand what's going on. But we pray you revive us. And Father, bless our time together as we study your word. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Whether you realize it or not, you are in a spiritual warfare. You have enemies against you, the world, the flesh, the devil, and his demonic forces. And it's, very, it's your responsibility and my responsibility to utilize the resources and the tools that God has made available for us in spiritual warfare. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10, gives us some of the resources that God have made available for every believer to be able to make a defensive stand against Satan and his demonic forces. And we've been looking at verse uh, 13 through 17. And I promise you tonight we're going to conclude uh, Ephesians because on Thursday we're going to begin our James study. But let's start with verse 13 again. We have already looked at uh, um, in great detail uh, the first uh, three peep, uh, the first three pieces of uh, the believer's armory, and that is the, in verse 14, we have the, uh, the uh, 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 our loins girded with truth, the breastplate of righteousness, as we looked at four already, uh, the, our loin, we are to gird our loins with truth, we are to put on the breastplate of righteousness, we are to uh, strap on our, on our feet, the preparation of the gospel of peace, and then the shield of faith. And so those are the four pieces of armory that we have already looked at. And now we're going to, uh, tonight, we're going to review 
uh, the shield of faith. And then we're going to go into the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit. So we're going to look at this a review of the shield of faith and then the helmet of salvation, then the sword of the spirit. So let's read uh, starting at verse 13. Once again, therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be capable to resist in the evil day. And having done everything or making all the necessary preparations, stand firm. Therefore, having girded your loins with truth, put on the breastplate of righteousness, prepare, uh, put on your feet the, with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, take up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. So we saw here with the shield of faith in our last class that the Roman soldier used a shield to hide behind for protection from arrows and flaming missiles uh, from the enemy. The shield that protects the believer in Jesus Christ, we saw, is the shield of faith. Our faith is our shield. And we saw that faith simply means taking God at his word or trusting God or believing God. No matter the adversity, no matter the heartache, the heartbreak, or no matter the disaster, uh, we are to let faith be our shield. Uh, and we looked at the faith risk drill, and we saw that anytime you're faced with adversity, anytime you're faced with trial, uh, anytime uh, you're faced with problem, we are to use the faith risk drill. And the faith risk drill works something like this. Recall to your mind a promise that God made in his word to you. Second, we believe that promise by faith. Third, we think of who and what God is, realizing that God is in control, and then we relax and wait on the Lord for deliverance. So again, the faith rest drill is one, recall into your mind a promise and a principle from the word of God. Two, claim those promises by faith. In other words, taking God at his word, believing that God said it, I believe in his time, I'm going to see what he promised me, taking God at his word. And then three, think of who God is. Think of his sovereignty. Think of his love. Think that he is all knowing. Think that he is truth. He cannot lie, but will keep his promise. So what you notice is you're shifting your attention from the circumstance and you're putting your eyes on God and him alone. So faith is trusting God, taking him at his word. No matter the situation, no matter how hard it is, no matter how difficult it is, we are commanded to take off the shield of faith. Let faith be your shield. And without faith, we saw that we can't even please God. If we're not living by faith, we're not pleasing God. And we saw that in Hebrew 11, verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. They that come to God must believe that he is and that he is a reward of those who are dealing to seek him. Only when we take God at his word can we avoid all of Satan's traps and snare that he set for us. The snares and traps of worry the snares and trap of anxiety, the snare and trap of our biggest enemy, which is fear. We saw that our biggest enemy is uh, fear. Fear is our biggest enemy. If you remember, the enemy of faith is fear. And I gave you an acrostic uh, of faith. Anybody remember uh, what faith stands for? What does the F stand for? Anybody remember? Failure to trust, the F in fear, failure to trust, the E in fear, emotional instability. Instead of thinking through the problem, recalling to your mind the word of God, the promise of God, you're emotional and stable. A in fear, arrogant reaction. You're preoccupied with yourself when you're afraid and with your problem rather than preoccupied with Christ and his promises, which is a solution to the problem. And that is arrogant. Arrogant is when we make it about us 
rather than make it about God. And then R, rejection of doctrine, the rejection of the teaching of the word of God. When we're afraid, we're choosing to reject the teaching of God's word. We're choosing not to apply the word of God to the problem. And that is our greatest enemy of faith, and that is fear. We are not to be afraid. God have not given us the spirit of fear. And then I gave you some principle related to the shield of faith. And I mentioned how our happiness should never depend on people and circumstance. This is a principle that I learned the hard way. See, I thank God for allowing me to be sentenced to 40 years in prison because I found a happiness when I didn't have nothing that did not depend on people and circumstance. If your happiness depend on whether people are meeting your expectation, you're gonna be on a roller coaster emotionally. You're gonna be up and down, mood swings, because you're happy to depend on people. And if you're happy to depend on whether the circumstance is good, then you are in trouble. You're gonna be on a roller coaster, an emotional roller coaster all your Christian life if you're happy to depend on whether circumstances are good or bad. Because here's the deal, people change, circumstances change. Peoples are humans. They're gonna fail you. They're gonna disappoint you. They can't meet your unrealistic expectation. Therefore, when they fail, if you're happy to depend on people, then you are gonna be emotionally unstable and you're gonna be on an emotional roller coaster mood swing you up one moment and you're down the next moment as a believer you should be up all the time <laughs> and the only way you can be up all the time is the shield of faith is trusting god no matter the problem only god can give you lasting happiness people cannot give you happiness that remains always only god can give you and i lasting happiness because the happiness that God gives does not depend on whether people are meeting your expectations or not. It don't depend on whether the circumstance good or bad. Let me tell you something. I'm going to sleep like a baby whether the circumstance are good or not or bad. Why? Because I trust God's word. I trust him with my problem. I trust him with my people problem, my circumstance problem, my disaster problem, my testing, my trial, I trust him. I take him at his word. I choose to think that of who he is. God is in control. And I let that circulate my mindset rather than me uh, choosing not to think of who God is and not to think God's promises. People's and things and circumstance change. So Things that make you happy one moment can also make you uh, sad the next. Your happiness should never depend on details of life. I want to show you something. Go to, uh, we as Christians need to master the details of life. We need to get to a place in our life where our happiness don't depend on whether circumstances are good or bad. Go to Second Chronicles. Go to 2 Chronicles chapter 1, and I want to show you something. A believer who mastered the detail of life, a believer who happiness did not depend on people's and circumstance. And look what happened when this believer happiness did not depend on people's circumstance. I want to show you something. Go to 2 Chronicles chapter 1, and I want to start at verse 7. And this is at the beginning of King Solomon's reign. God is going to appear, uh, appear to Solomon at night and is going to ask Solomon, what can I want to bless you? Okay, let's see. Let's read, start reading at verse seven. And that night God appeared to Solomon and said to him, ask what I shall give you. So here we see God desired to give Solomon something. But let's look at what his request was. Let's look at what his request was. Solomon said to God, you have dealt with my father, David, with great loving kindness. So now what is he doing? He's recalling to his mind the faithfulness of God to David and keeping his promises to David, his father. 
He said, and have made me king in his place. So God, you're faithful. You kept your promise. Know that his attention is on God right here. Verse eight, now, O Lord God, your promise to my father David is fulfilled. For you have made me king over a people as numerous as the dust of the earth. In other words, you have given me a spiritual responsibility. Give me now wisdom and knowledge. <clears throat> so notice something. Solomon did not ask for details of life. He did not ask for the thing that most of us would ask for. He didn't ask for anything temporal. He asked for wisdom and knowledge. I need the ability to discern between good and evil so that I may fulfill this responsibility that you have given me. So in other words, Solomon's priority was not the accumulating of detail. His priority was, I need what it takes to fulfill your plan for my life. You made me king. But well, watch this, that I may go out and come in before this people, for who can rule this great people of yours? In other words, this is humility, realizing that if you don't give me wisdom and knowledge, I cannot fulfill your plan for my life. So this is humility, depending on God. Verse 11, God, look at God's response to humility and faith. Watch God respond to humility and faith. God said to Solomon, because you had this in your thinking and you did not ask for details, riches, wealth, honor, or the life of those who hate you, nor have you asked for a long life but you have asked for yourself wisdom and knowledge that you may rule my people over whom I have made you king. So why didn't Solomon ask for the details of life, like riches and wealth, honor, a long life? Why didn't he ask for those things? Because Solomon realized that happiness is not found in these things. Happiness is not found in these things. Because if happiness were found in these things, he would have asked for these things first. Happiness was found in pursuing the plan of God for your life, for his life. And so that's what he was mostly concerned about. And guess what? When he's mostly concerned about the plan and the will of God, all those other things just got to fall in place. <laughs> it just got to fall in place. Because watch this, verse 12. God say, wisdom and knowledge I've been granted to you. And you know what? I got a bonus for you because you didn't make these other things your God. And I will give you riches and wealth and honor, such as none of the king who were before you has possessed, nor those who will come after you. In other words, Solomon did not substitute the plan of God for riches, wealth, or any detail of life. He wanted God's plan to be fulfilled in his life above any and every other thing. And God gave, God can give him the details of life and it not distracts him because he didn't look to those things for happiness. See, the believer that looked to the details of life for happiness, they're distracted from the plan of God. They're distracted. And what they find out once they, that, that you can lose all those things. And when they lose all these things without already having God's happiness, when they lose all of these things, then they're unhappy because they had their hope and their trust in the wrong things instead of having their hope and trust in God and him alone. Most people, they lose all their money right now today. Satan will take advantage of them. He will discourage them. He will discourage them. He would discourage them. He will, he will uh, call them to go in depression. Some will even think of committing suicide when they lose their wealth and lose their, their health and, and all these uh, things. Or even if they lose relationship, they think they can't live no more. Let me tell you something. That is, that is emotional instability. That is a person who depends on the details of life are happening instead of depending on God. The believer who trusts in people, money, success, marriage, sex, or any detail of life for happiness, 
and not his faith in God, that believer is unstable and vulnerable to satanic attack. Satan can defeat that believer because that believer's hope and trust is in the wrong thing. And Satan is going to take advantage. That, that believer is very weak. He's a weak believer or she's a weak believer. And I showed y'all in Jeremiah uh, 17, 5, how God warns us not to depend on earthly things. That's why so many of us are cursed, because we depend on earthly things instead of depending on God. So those were some principles related to the faith rest life, or the, I mean, the shield of faith. Uh, and, and simply put, our trust and our hope should always be in God and his promises. And if it is, then we will protect ourselves from fear that Satan is going to throw at us, worry and anxiety. All those are Satan's error to, to neutralize us spiritually, to make us emotionally unstable, and to lead us in disobedience to God's word and to make us depressed and discouraged and stressful. Let me tell you something, stress is optional. We choose to be stressful. We choose to be stressful because when a person is stressful, he chooses not to trust the Lord. That person is choosing not to slam all of his problem on the Lord, believing in who he is and believing his promises and his word. And if they don't study the Bible, you're not going to have no promises to believe or claim. And therefore, the end result is stress. Well, I got a stress reliever for you. And it won't cost you anything. It's called the promises of God. <laughs> Take God at his word. God said it. I believe it. And at his time, I'm going to see what he promised. In spite of my circumstance, in spite of my situation, I'm not going to fear. I'm not going to worry. Don't be afraid of COVID. Don't be afraid of the freedom that we're losing in our country. Don't be afraid of anything. Paul said, let, go to, go to Philippians right quick. Listen, listen what Paul say in Philippian uh, chapter. Uh, and see, that's one of Satan's tactics is to get us wrapped up in fear to neutralize our spiritual growth and to get us to depend on peoples and things. But look at Philippians. Look what Paul is saying in Philippians, Philippians um, chapter 4. Chapter 4, look at verse uh, chapter four, verse 4. Chapter 4, verse 4, Philippians. Rejoice in the Lord always. You know, here's my translation of this verse here. Rejoice in the Lord always. What he's saying is, be happy all the time. Be happy all the joy. In other words, see, God's happening is a joy where no matter circumstances are good or bad. He say, rejoice in the Lord always. Now, if, if, if the Lord is commanding us through Paul to rejoice always, he's letting us know that we can be happy all the time, no matter the circumstance. But we must trust God. That's the only way to be happy all the time. That's the only way to have joy all the time is living moment by moment in faith, taking God at his word, believe in him, believe in his promises, believing in who he is, rejoicing in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your generous spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Look at verse six. Don't worry about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. So in other words, we're not. To, so if I'm worrying, the word of God telling me, do not worry about anything. So if I'm worried about something, then I'm sinning. I'm out of fellowship with God. I'm choosing not to uh, trust. I'm rejecting the word of God when I'm worried. But in every, no, whatever it is that have came in your life, Take it to the Lord in prayer. Oh, we love to sing that song. Oh, what's the song called? A little old hymn. Take it to the Lord. I don't even know how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> it goes something like take it to the Lord in prayer. But rather do we do that instead of taking it to the Lord in prayer, we worry about it. 
We sit there and be afraid. Uh, and therefore, you have brought stress on yourself. See, I, I don't want to. I don't want nothing for high blood pressure because that ain't that don't that don't take care of the root of the problem. You know what? The solution to high blood pressure is called faith. <laughs> it's called taking God at His word. That see, look, you ain't had to pay for that. I just gave you a solution, and you didn't even have to pay me. It's free of charge. <laughs> Is faith, take God, believe God. People who got high blood pressure got a lot of pressure on their mind because of all the different circumstances and problems that is going on in their life. And therefore, instead of trusting God with the problem, they're afraid, they worried, they're discouraged, they're depressed and all that. And therefore, they need high blood pressure pills. So... Stop giving the, 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 the people, your, the doctors, your money and just trust God. <laughs> Saturate your mind with the promises of God. Contemplate on who God is. And the more you contemplate on who God is and get your mind on what he promised you, guess what? Your problems just start to shrink it. They start looking very small. <laughs> they start looking very small when you start looking at how big God is. As as uh, who that who who was that that said? Is there anything too hard for God? Look at Romans right quick. Well, well, before we go to Romans, let's read on right here in verse seven. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, the peace of God here is the happiness of God. It is tranquility of soul, where you have where you are relaxed instead of panicking. That's the peace of God. Even in the midst of adversity, you can have God peace where people look at you and say, man, that person is going through a lot, but yet they seem to be unfazed. They seem to be smiling. They're, they're, I mean, they're, they still enjoy riding a bicycle. They still enjoy going to the park. They haven't rolled up in a corner saying, I wish I was dead. <laughs> like most believers do. When they go out through problems and trials and adversity, they just wish they was dead, want to commit suicide. They don't enjoy riding the bicycle anymore. Uh, uh, just normal. They can't even function in just normal everyday activity because they're so depressed. <laughs> and they're so depressed because they're choosing not to trust God. So it is your fault, self-induced misery, if you're stressful and have high blood pressure. <laughs> Hey, I just helped you solve a lot of your health problems. <laughs> it, it, it's called faith. It's called living moment by moment. I guarantee if you will moment by moment choose not to be afraid, choose not to worry, choose not to give in to anxiety, choose not to panic, but say, you know what? I'm going to saturate my mind with the promise of God. I'm going to grow in knowledge of God by spending time in his word. I'm going to take these problems to the Lord in prayer. I guarantee your health will get better. <laughs> I guarantee your health will get better. All right. Go, uh, and, and, and now I want you to go to Romans right quick. Romans chapter 8. Look what Romans 8 say. Which should give us reason why not to worry. God did the greatest thing he can ever do for us. When he gave us his son. So if he did the greatest that he can ever do for us, what make us think that God's going to give do any less for us? And that was when we was his enemies. But now we are his children. If he did the greatest that he can never do for us when we were his enemies. Oh, he's going to do even more now that we are his friend, now that we are his children. So why do we worry? Why do we fear? Look at Romans 8, verse, uh, verse, uh, look at verse 31 and 32. Romans 8, verse 31 and 32. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. How will he not with him freely give us all things? So if God did the greatest 
if he did the greatest thing he can ever do for what make us think that he would do any less? Trust him. Trust him. Take him at his word. Believe him. He got great things in store for you and I. We have no need to be afraid. So that's the, 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 the shield of faith. All right. So let's go back to Romans. We could, that's the conclude, conclusion on the shield of faith. Now let's go to go back to Ephesians chapter 6. And now let's look at this other piece of armor called the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. All right, so now we go to the this other piece of armor, verse uh, 17, and take the helmet of salvation. Now, the Roman soldier helmet was made of leather and metal designed to protect the head against arrows and, 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 and swords, okay? What protects the Christian? What protects the believer in Jesus Christ? His salvation. It say the helmet of salvation. So our salvation protects us. Now remember, there are three phases of our salvation. There are three phases of our salvation. You may want to write this down as we are review. And we, we learned this in Romans. In our Romans, uh, there are three phases of salvation. But this salvation he's talking about is the second phase. There are three phases of our salvation. Phase one justification now justification is when we're saved from the penalty of our sins now that's when we believe in jesus christ the moment we believe in jesus christ god saves us from the penalty of sin that's justification second phase of our salvation is sanctification sanctification is god saving us from the power of sin through his word and through his spirit that lives in us. And then the third phase of our salvation is glorification. Glorification is the future aspect of our salvation when we will be delivered from the presence of sin forever when we go to heaven. When we go to heaven, we're going to get resurrection body at the rapture or at death. We're going to get resurrection body at the rapture and our sin nature is going to be taken away and we'll be delivered from the presence of sin forever. But what salvation is he talking about in verse 17? Well, the heaven of salvation here speaks of the second phase of our salvation, which is sanctification. In other words, the only way we can be sanctified in our practice here on earth is we must apply the word of God to every era of our life. That is our defensive stand against the attacks of the devil. So we are to take the helmet of salvation. In other words, we are to apply. We are to learn and apply the word of God to life if we want to be able to make a defensive stand against Satan's attack. See, phase two of our salvation, we're told by Paul, as he wrote to the Philippian, go to Philippians 2.12, you and I and the Philippian believer are told to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Whenever we're told to do something, it's not talking about your uh, uh, past aspect of your salvation justification because we can't save ourselves from the penalty of sin. It's not talking about the future aspect of our salvation where we're saved from the presence of sin forever. The only way we can work is we learn and apply God's word to the experiences of life. That is the only way we're set apart from sin unto God for his use and purpose. That is our part. So in other words, let the principle of God's word renew and transform your mind. That is, that's how you, that's how you take a defensive stand against Satan and his demonic forces, and let God's word change your way of thinking. Because when God's word change your way of thinking, then you can make better decisions, and that is going to set you apart 
in sanctification. That is how you're made holy in practice. Go to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, let's look at verse 1 through um, 1 through uh, 8. 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 through 8. Verse 1 say, Finally, then, brethren, we exhort and we quit, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us instruction as to how you ought to walk or live and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you excel still more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. For here is the will of God, your sanctification. That is, that you abstain from sexual immorality. What is sexual immorality? This word immorality is the Greek word pornos, where we get pornography from. And so whenever we engage in pornography, we are not being set apart unto God. We're not being allowing God through our decision to make us holy. Sexual immorality or porno. This is all types of sexual sin. Any use of sex in a way that God did not design sex to be you. Incest. That is pornos. Pornography. Okay, that's pornos. Fornication. Some people say, well, I'm not fornicating uh, against anybody. Yes, you are. If you're masturbating, if you're looking at some some new pictures of women's and, and, and you're masturbating or, or men or whatever, pornos. <laughs> hey, we think that because we're looking at some new pictures or of women's or men's and, and masturbating or have your little deal door or whatever you call it, pornos, that is sexual immorality. He said, well, nobody don't see me. Oh, God sees you. He everywhere. Live in light of who God is. He sees everything. Pornos, uh, 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 incest, fornication, adultery, homosexuality, sex outside of marriage, adultery, all that is pornos. And, that, and when I'm engaging in that, I am not applying the word of God. I am not being progressively sanctified. But if I apply the prince of God's word, I protect myself from that temptation. I protect, see, Satan attacks us. Nothing wrong with sex, but the wrong use of sex, it is wrong. And we need God's word to show us what is the right use of sex. And when I apply God's word, then I protect myself against temptation. So that's what this, uh, the, the, the heaven of salvation is. You have a responsibility and I have a responsibility to apply God's word so that I can be saved from the power of sin in my life. I'm not to continue to be a slave to my sin nature because God has given me his power, his spirit. He gave me his word. Now I am to learn it. I am to apply it. And I am saved and delivered when I use the principle of God's word to the problem. And I'm going to be honest with you. We sin because we want to sin. We're choosing to rebel against God when we choose not to believe and apply his word. Thank God. He's so gracious. He's so long suffering. But God long suffering. The, you know, here's the scary thing. The more long suffering God is with us, the more of his discipline we're piled in up when we continue to do it. The more long suffering he is, the more of his discipline is piling up. And man, when he let, when he opened the floodgates, when he let open the floodgate of discipline, it's gonna be very, very, it's gonna seem very unbearable. Very unbearable. And I don't want God to let the floodgates uh, on me. I want to keep short accounts with God. Every time I sis, I done fail or thought something wrong, I'm gonna confess. Because I don't want the floodgate to get so you know high on me. Well, I get drowned in discipline 
or drowning in suffering. I don't need that, but God is long suffering. And, and some people, when God don't immediately judge, they think that God is like, oh, I'm okay with what you're doing. You know, I, oh, just because he haven't judged, it don't mean he's okay with sin. That just is grace. All right, but anyway. Verse four, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentile who do not know God. So here we're told that we are to be sanctified. We are to be set apart from sin. And God uses his word to set us apart from sin, to protect us from satanic attacks and temptation. Go to uh, John 15. John 15, the gospel of John 15. I think it's 15 or 13 where Jesus is praying for his disciple. And he prayed to the Father. I think it's I think I think it's uh, I think it's thirteen in his high priestly prayer. He prayed that the Father will sanctify the believer, but then he he shared with us the mean by which God sanctify or set apart the believer in his practice. Uh, I think it's uh, where is it? Where is it, Chad? 14, Sanctify. is it chapter 14? Is it 14? What verse? Um, oh, oh, you, you, you uh, I'm looking for that verse where he prays, it's the, it, it, it gotta be the high priestly prayer when he prayed for his disciple and he asked the father to sanctify the believer in the truth. Um, if anybody, what is it? John 17. Uh, for, uh, 14, 17? No, 17. John 17 is where he's praying for. Okay. Uh, yeah, 17, chapter 17, verse 17. 17, 17. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is the truth. So here, he prays that the Father will set the believer apart in practice through his word. That's how God do it. So that is the helmet of salvation is when we practice the principles of the word. And our Lord Jesus Christ was the, a, a great example of, of using the helmet of salvation and the uh, sword of the spirit. So we're to practice the word. All right, let's go now to the sword of the spirit. Let's go to the sword of the spirit. All right, go back to Ephesians. All right, so now let's look at this next piece of armory, which is take the heaven of salvation and what else? The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So here, a sword, uh, I mean, a, a Roman soldier's sword was a very short sword. Why? For close combat. For close combat. Now, the word here, word, is not the Greek word logos. It is another Greek word, and that is rhema. Rhema. And rhema here refers to a Pacific word, a Pacific word are a specific utterance of God. It is a reference to a promise or a principle from the Bible. It is a reference to a promise or a principle from the Bible. We need not just a knowledge of scripture, but we need a specific knowledge of for a for different areas of our life. Don't you know that different areas of our life, there's a scripture in the word of God for different areas of our life. So we can use this knowledge of scripture to whatever experience we face here in the world. So the sword of the spirit is that promise, is that principle from the word of God for the different areas of your life. 
And our Lord Jesus Christ demonstrated this in the wilderness when he was tested by Satan. When he was tested by Satan. What did when, when Jesus was tested by Satan, did he do did he do this? Oh, I rebuke you, uh, devil, in the name of uh, uh, in the name of my father. Did he rebuke him? See, that would be going on the offensive. Rebuking him or attacking the devil. You know, you got people that they so silly that they attack the devil. <laughs> they attack him, they rebuke him. Okay. No, that ain't that ain't say laugh at stuff like that. No, we don't rebuke him. We don't rebuke him. God and his angel fight our battles. All we do is take a defensive stand like our Lord Jesus Christ did in his humanity. He took a defensive stand. Let's go there. Go to Matthew 4. I know y'all, some of y'all Bible scholars, you're familiar with this, with this, uh, this uh, incident in Matthew 4. But notice Christ did not take an offensive stand in his humanity against the devil. He took a defensive stand, not an offensive stand. He didn't go to rebuking the devil or attacking the devil like so many people ignorantly do. But look, he's saying, verse, let's start at verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. Now, Satan is about to tempt him. Now, this is a real life experience. In his humanity, he was tempted. Okay? And the tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. Now, he knew Jesus was the son of God. He knew he was the son of God, but he was trying to get Jesus to obey him rather than obey his father, which would make him sinful and therefore not to be qualified to be the savior of the world. And so he look, look, look at Jesus' response. He had a specific principle from the word of God for this specific temptation and problem. It said, but he answered and said, it is written. He's recalling to his mind a specific principle from the word of God for this particular temptation. So he is he applying doctrine to experience. He's applying doctrine to, he don't just have knowledge of God's word. He's actually applying that word to life experience it, what makes him wise. That's wisdom. Wisdom is the correct application of knowledge. When you are able to skillfully apply God's word to the experiences of life, you are a wise person. You are a wise person. Christ displayed a knowledge of scripture, but not only did he display a knowledge of scripture, but he had an accurate knowledge of scripture. See, Satan twisted scripture. He used it the wrong way, but Jesus was very accurate. We don't just need scripture. We need accurate and sound Bible teaching. Because if we don't have accurate sound of Bible teaching, we're going to twist the word of God. And when we twist the word, we're going to apply it wrongly in our life. We as Christian, we need to know and use scripture accurately. So many believers don't think that they need to study God's word every day. No wonder you're so defeated all the time. <laughs> no wonder say take advantage of you all the time. Many believers don't know scripture enough to uh to 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 be to defend themselves in any given situation you as a believer and me as a believer we should be able to defend ourselves in every situation that we find ourselves in here on earth but we gotta stay in the word we got it because if you're let me tell you something a test is designed to try what you know and if you're not in class, you're going to fail the test. Or if you're in class and you're distracted, worrying about what the who win that game, and you're not concentrating on the teaching of the word, or you're distracted from the word, you're going to fail the test. You're not going to be able to apply the word of God to experience. So many believers so ineffective in battle against Satan because they have only a partial knowledge or no knowledge at all 
of God's word. The Lord and his angels do all the offensive warfare for us as believers. I'll draw and take a defensive stand. Saturate your mind and your soul in the word of God. That's your defense. That is the protector of your soul and your mind. If you want to overcome pornography, if you want to overcome temptation, saturate your mind with the word and apply it when the temptation presents itself. If you want to overcome drug addiction, same thing. You want to overcome worry and fear, which is sin. If you want to protect yourself from discouragement or whatever, saturate your soul and your mind with the word of God, and you're going to be very effective in spiritual warfare when Satan attacks you. And guess what Satan would do when you go to apply the friends of the word? He flee from you because you are submitting to God in humility by applying his word. Don't you know when you apply God's word to a problem, that's humility. That's humility. You're like, man, I cannot fight this on my own, but I'm going to use God's word to fight this battle. <laughs> that's humility. That's submitting to God. And the Bible says submit to God and say will flee from you. Now, he's going to come back at the opportune time. He's going to catch you slipping. He's going to catch you with your hand in the cookie jar and with your pants down. He's going to catch you when you get away from the word. He's going to say, I'm going to get them. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get them busy. I'm going to get them busy with everything, good things. And then once you get so busy, you ain't got the word of God. It's just all of a sudden, you're tempted like you've never been tempted before. <laughs> and you fall. All right. I want to close with the purpose of the Bible. I want to give you, I want to give you uh, seven purposes of the Bible, seven purposes. Purpose number one, the Bible gives us divine standards. The Bible gives us divine standards. Psalm 119, verse 89 and 91. Let's go there. We're going to have to do this very quickly. I got like four minutes. Go to Psalm 119, verse 89 through 91. Psalm 119, 89 through 91. 119, 89, 91, read something like this. 89 say, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Your faithfulness continues throughout all generation. You establish the earth and it stands. They stand this day according to your ordinances, for all things are your servants. So here we see that everything must be measured by the Bible. The Bible reveals what is right and what is wrong. So we are to measure what's right or determine what's right and wrong based on what the word of God says about right and wrong. Whatever the word of God says is right is right. Whatever the word of God says is wrong is wrong. And without the word of God, you'll be calling wrong right and right wrong. And therefore fall victim to satanic attack. So many believers, because their lack of understanding of the word of God, call evil good and good evil. Look at verse 160 of the same psalm, Psalm 119, verse 160. Verse 1, 6 to say, the psalm of your word is truth. Only God's word provide reliable truth. And every one of your righteous ordinances is everlasting. God's word is righteous. So whatever God's word say is righteous. Second purpose of God's word, the Bible, it is a guide for our life. You want guidance in your life? You want to know who you should marry? You want to know, uh, 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 you want divine guidance? Well, the word of God gives direction for every area of your life. It gives specific guidance to many areas of your life. Look at Psalm 119, 105. Look at verse 105 in the same psalm. Verse 105 say, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. In other words, the word of God gives guidance. 
it gives direction. So if you want direction for some specific crossroad in your life, the word of God will give you guidance. And if you study the word of God often and regularly, you're going to have all the guidance you need when you need it. Three, the word of God protects us from discouragement because it provides comfort, it gives us teaching, and it also encourages us. Romans 15, 4. It, endure, it, it helps us endure life difficulty and have hope or not lose hope. So it protects us from discouragement. That's why we need the word. It helps us endure life difficulties. Four, it calls us, it, it, it cautions us about the mistakes of other believers. So there are many examples in the past that we are to avoid. Like, you know, Israel not wanting God to rule over them and the consequences of that. We can learn from the mistakes of others in the Bible. So the Bible cautions us through the mistakes of other believers. 1 Corinthians 10, 11 through 12. Couple more, two more, y'all. Five. It is a tool against temptation, which we just saw in Matthew 4. It is a tool against temptation. Six. It gives us accurate knowledge about God and his plan for our life. Without the word of God, our knowledge of God is not complete. And then lastly, seven. It causes us to be equipped as God's servants. The word of God causes us to be equipped as God's servant. And I close with this last scripture on that same note. It causes us to be equipped as God's servant. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, and then we'll close. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 through 17. Uh, six. six, it gives us knowledge of God and his plan for our life. Without knowledge of God's word, our knowledge of God and his plan is incomplete. All right, 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17. Verse 16 say all scripture, that means Old and New Testament. When this was written, Paul was only making reference to the Old Testament. But now that we have the completed word, it, it's, it's the Old and New Testament. All scripture is God breathed or inspired by God and is profitable or useful for what? One, teaching. And then teaching here means the word of God gives us correct doctrine on what we to believe. The word of God provides sound doctrine on what we are to believe. If you want to know what you're to believe, go to the word of God. Two, for reproof, reproof or rebuking. The word of God convicts us of sin and, 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 and what not to believe. The word of God will show us what we're not to believe. And it will also convict us of sin and error. So the first two, teaching and reproof, deals with correct belief. And then uh, third, for correction, is useful for correction. In other words, the word of God would disclose wrong behavior. If you're behaving wrongly, that's why a lot of people don't like studying the word of God, because it'll show you whether you're behaving wrongly. It exposes you. In other words, it'll show you what not to do. And then four, for training in righteousness, it will develop right behavior. It will conform you into the image of Jesus Christ. And what is the goal? Verse 17, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every Oh my goodness, I don't know what happened.
I don't know what happened. Oh, I hit something and it, it disappeared. <laughs> So he help us. So the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work or adequate, prepared, mature, and complete and capable for every good work. So in conclusion, God's word is the only tool that can equip us to be women and men of God who is adequate, prepared, mature, complete, and capable for every good work. It is the only message that we have to share with people that can lead to their salvation, that can change their lives, and that can help them grow to spiritual maturity. All right, that concludes our study of Ephesians, the armor of God. And I hope you all uh, enjoyed it. And I'm sure about five years from now, we'll probably be doing another Ephesians study if the rapture haven't happened. Uh, but thank you all for being such great students. And uh, prepare your heart for James, and we're not going to take a break. We're going to just get right back into it. <laughs> we'll get right back into it. We'll start with James on uh, on next week. Any questions or comments before we close out in prayer? Any questions or comments? Anybody? It was a Thank good you. lesson. Thank you. And also, um, you went to Psalms 119. But Psalms 119 actually tells us how to live holy. That's you good. Know? Yeah, the whole entire psalm. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. As I, it's a good psalm to spend some time in. How shall a young man keep his way per? By keeping mm -hmm. it according to your word. According to his word. Yeah. And then yeah. it said, before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now <laughs> I keep your word. <laughs> <laughs> Walk according to his law. That's it. Live in the word. Keep his testimonies and be blessed. Amen. I did it right. in reverse. <laughs> so everybody, everybody, so for homework, read Psalm 119. <laughs> One so, yeah. Hey, let's close in prayer. I mean, no more questions are coming. Thank you so much. All right. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for you preserving your word so that we can have all these spiritual benefits described in our study tonight. And Father, help us to take, uh, and, uh, to take this opportunity to utilize this gift, this resource, this tool, your word, uh, for every experience and every problem that we will endure. Keep our minds and heart until we meet again. In Christ's name, amen. 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 All right, good night, everybody. Thank you.